I can almost promise you that your forest is not growing as quickly as it should. It doesn't matter how much land you own, it doesn't matter what species are on that land, it doesn't matter how old those species are, your forest could be growing as much as 54% faster. And you can achieve that growth rate by doing one very simple thing. But to be able to achieve this, you have to understand something about forest growth. So if you stick through this video and listen to my little lecture here, I promise you not only are you going to learn a lot about forestry and forest growth, but you're going to be able to manage your land a lot more effectively. So first, let's talk about forest growth. Now, you would think that forest growth is a pretty straightforward metric, but actually in forestry, uh, all the numbers are kind of like looking at a balance sheet or a cash flow statement for a business. There's a lot of different numbers that mean a lot of different things, and you kind of have to know what you're looking for and what you're looking at in order to drive any sort of useful information out of it. So first thing to consider is that there's a very large difference between a forest growth rate and a tree growth rate. So probably a lot of you watching right now are thinking that the tip I'm going to provide is thinning. You know, if you thin your forest, you can increase your growth rates. That's not actually what I'm going to suggest, and that's not even accurate. Think about it this way. If you decrease the density of your forest, then you have less trees growing. So in most cases, if not all cases, when you actually reduce the density of your forest, you're decreasing the growth rate, at least in the short term. Thinning is more about increasing the growth rate per tree, because it's not just about how fast those trees grow, but wood locked in larger trees is actually more valuable. Instead, forest growth rate is about the aggregate growth on a given piece of land, and that's measured by some unit of wood volume per some unit of land volume per some unit of time volume. So for example, in most of the world, that would be cubic meters per hectare per metric year. In the United States, that would be cords per acre per year. So we're going to be paying attention primarily to how many cords of wood a particular acre can grow in a given year. But even then, there are two different metrics. There's one that's more the biologically important metric and then the economically important metric. The biologically important metric is the gross growth rate. And the gross growth rate, as you can imagine, is just the total amount of growth that occurred on that acre. The economically important metric is net. So that would be gross growth rate minus mortality. So remember that and we'll come back to it later. But next, I want to talk about what things actually affect forest growth rate. We can pretty much break this down into four different things. We have age, species, site, and climate. If you've watched a few of my videos, you may have heard me mention this before, but it's a very important concept to understand, so I don't mind repeating it. When trees, and in this case stands, are very young, they're growing very slowly. When trees are very old and have reached maturity, they are likewise growing very slowly. But when trees are in that intermediate phase, when they're what we would call pole-sized timber, they have enough foliage to actually photosynthesize effectively, and they are growing very quickly. The more trees you have in this intermediate stage of growth, the faster your overall growth rate is going to be. Next is, of course, species, and this one's pretty straightforward. Some species just grow a lot faster than others. The more fast-growing species you have on your land, the faster your forest is going to grow. Then we have site, and while soil science and the, the science of site quality is actually extremely complicated, you can pretty much just distill it into saying that the more resources a site has, the faster trees are going to grow. And this isn't just about the soil, it's about sunlight also. For example, southern facing slopes are going to get more sunlight on average, so they're going to have better growth rates than north facing slopes. And of course, trees that both have enough nutrients and an adequate supply of water are going to be more conducive to faster growth rates than trees that are either extremely dry, extremely nutrient poor, or something otherwise that prevents resources from actually reaching the trees. And finally, we have climate. So I actually have a map here of gross forest growth rates in the United States, and you can see that down in the southeast, they tend to have much faster growth rates than in the northeast. And the reason is uh, essentially climate. You know, in Maine, we only have a two to three month growing season for trees, and in the southeast, that might be as much as five months. But importantly, these four factors are all interdependent on one another. So for example, in the southeast, they also grow species that grow faster, probably because of the climate. Also, sites that are better quality are probably going to grow trees that grow faster. Although there's a little bit of a nuance there because of uh, the types of sites that softwoods occupy, but nonetheless, I think it's a good rule of thumb. 
And so out of those four, the only factor that's going to be relatively independent of the others is age. It doesn't really matter the climate, site, or species on the stand. They can be any age they need to be. So let's get back to the original question. How do we increase forest growth rates on our land? And based on the previous information, you might be thinking age. If we can manipulate the age of our forest into being in that intermediate phase, we can increase our growth rates. And that is true. And in fact, that is what a lot of larger forestry companies try to do on a very large scale. Unfortunately, there are a lot of consequences there. I'm gonna have a different video addressing that because it can get pretty complicated. Um, but in short, that's, that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. Now, of course, you can't really affect site or climate to any substantial degree. So the answer must lie in species. And again, that's something that can be done and is very frequently done by larger forestry companies. If you can use some sort of silvicultural means, whether that's pre-commercial thinning, planting, or even herbicides, to shift the composition into a type of species that grows faster, obviously that's going to have a substantial impact on the overall growth rate of your forest. But that comes at a very real trade-off. When you do that, you're kind of valuing growth rate over other attributes. So for example, some of the fastest growing species aren't very valuable. So obviously you have to have some sort of compromise between growth rate and value. And that's usually what ends up happening most of the time. So for example, in Northern Maine, they pretty much exclusively plant spruce with a little bit of pine. And that's because these species are both fast growing and fairly valuable. So that can make silvicultural sense. It makes economic sense. Everything about that checks out, but it's a fairly limited business model. You kind of box yourself into a corner when you're looking just at those things. Those companies that are just planting spruce, they could make a lot of money, but it comes at the sacrifice of diversity. Their business model is now based on a very specific industry and a very specific product type. Instead, I wanna be able to increase the growth rates on my land without accruing any specific compromise or cost. So how we do that actually has very little, if anything, to do with anything I've really mentioned. Instead, we have to go back to how exactly we define and measure growth, and in particular, the economically significant metric that I discussed, and that would be gross growth minus mortality. If you make that mortality number as close to zero as possible, you're going to explode your growth rate. And to give you a real example of the potential impact here, let's look at forest growth numbers from the state of New York. So their gross growth is actually 0.4 cords per acre per year, and that's a state average. But their net growth, that is gross growth minus mortality, is only 0.35 cords per acre per year. And to be fair, if I had to guess, part of the reason their mortality is so high is because they have things like the Adirondack Park where there's not a lot of logging, they have a lot of mature forests, etc. So there's quite a fair amount of mortality. But nonetheless, imagine if you could reduce that mortality rate to near zero. From 0.35 to 0.54, that is a 54% increase in your annual growth rate. What difference is a 54% increase in annual growth going to make over the life of your forest? Now, in my last video, I actually talked about one of the benefits of buying a younger forest is that you have more of a hand in influencing its trajectory over its entire life. So just take this one example. What if you had that land and you basically made it your mission to ensure that no tree ever fell to the forest floor naturally? You could have vastly better returns versus the alternative. And I've actually seen this effect play out in real time. I was fortunate enough to be able to see the differences in management between two different parcels, one of which was, I would say, more managed on an industrial business model. So those things I talked about earlier, keeping trees younger, planting, stuff like that. And the other one was, you could say, more micromanaged, more artisanally managed. Um, they, they went around and they were really just trying to capture that mortality, as we would say, which is, you know, that means harvest the mortality. And the growth rate, on this parcel was much higher than on this parcel. Now, of course, that's not, you can never compare two parcels of land entirely, but I'm sure a very large percent of that difference came from the management styles. So the question is, how exactly you manage your forest in such a way as to greatly reduce or even eliminate mortality? And the answer there is by understanding and eliminating the two main types of mortality. So the first type of mortality comes in that intermediate stage of growth 
when trees are growing very rapidly. The trees per acre count at this point is very high and they're growing quickly and they're competing with one another. So over time, that trees per acre count begins to drop as trees grow larger and time goes on. In silviculture, we refer to this as the stem exclusion phase. And this is a very natural process and is necessary, but the problem is those trees that are dropping out of the stand are trees that have already produced wood for you. They might have been slacker workers, but they were workers nonetheless. And it makes sense to cash in on their production if you possibly can. And this is where, yes, thinning does come into play. I kind of dissed thinning earlier, but this is where going in and trying to remove those stems, like with a low thinning, uh, removing those stems that are likely to drop out of the stand can have a positive impact for you. Not only is it reducing that mortality that is detracting from the overall growth rate, but hopefully if you have the proper markets, you're getting a little return from that in any case. Now, the other type of mortality to understand is mortality just from old age and senescence. And this is where even age silviculture can really shine. And it's a very simple solution that has a cost, but it, it works. What even age silviculture really does, and just you know for, for clarity, even age silviculture could be clear cutting, shelter wood, seed tree, something like that, where you're keeping all the trees in the stand relatively the same age. So what that's going to do is it's going to kind of put a cap on how old the trees can be. Some of the trees may still be healthy and growing, but it's kind of more or less putting a cap on how much they can grow. And it's restarting the stand after a certain point. Obviously that can work, but it comes at the cost of potentially limiting uh, some of the greatest productive capacity of your forest. Potentially, not always. And the other system that I think really shines at this because it doesn't necessarily have that problem is the selection system. And selection systems are by definition uneven age, so it's for stands where there's a lot of different age classes in the forest. But what a selection system is going to do is it's going to pick out the trees that are either poor quality to improve the, the quality of the forest, but also that are unhealthy, that are older and likely to die. And so you're picking out those trees and you're allowing those better, more healthy, more valuable trees to grow. And you can also go in to the younger age classes, like what you do with the thinning, and pick out those trees likely to be outcompeted that aren't going to make it to maturity. So while the selection system can, in all honesty, be a little more art than science, and there's a lot of different definitions and practices and methodologies, uh, I think it can be broadly defined as the, the main goal of a selection harvest is to decrease the mortality, and so it can really shine in this objective. So it really is that easy. Just by controlling your mortality, you can vastly increase the growth rate of your forest by as much as 54% per year. Sometimes when you talk to the forestry community and landowners, there is a lot of pessimism about this, that, and the other thing. And some of that pessimism is warranted, and some of that pessimism is not. And one of the things I wanna highlight, not only with this video, but this channel, is that the forest industry in general is incredibly wasteful. There's a lot of different forms that waste can take. And you have to understand those different forms of waste and try to prevent them. And that's vastly going to increase the productivity and returns of your forest asset. And so that's why I wanted to discuss this because mortality is probably the most obvious but also overlooked form of waste that you have. And if you don't think you have mortality on your stand, you're dead wrong. There are hundreds of stems per acre. I promise you some of them are on their way to death if they haven't died out already. Even on my land, I have a very young stand. I'm actively harvesting my land. I still have mortality. Everyone has mortality and it is kind of unavoidable even if you're trying to avoid it. But reconsider your strategies, reconsider what you're doing, reconsider the health of your forest and think if there's something that you can do to decrease mortality and increase your net growth. Now, as a caveat to all this, you don't want to make mortality and reducing mortality the core purpose of your management plan and strategy. And that is because going around and just capturing mortality, unless you're very naturalist in your management, which is fine, uh, you're doing nothing to actually influence the trajectory of growth. You're doing nothing to influence the species composition. You're doing nothing to influence the quality of the forest. You're doing nothing to influence the efficiency of later harvest, nothing of that source. All you're doing is just preventing trees from falling to the ground naturally. So if you wanna learn more about other management styles and how to manage your forest for all different objectives and dynamics, I highly recommend 
uh, you go to my website and download my free ebook. It's called How to Read Your Forest. I wrote it myself based on my experiences both as a professional forester and a landowner myself. And I promise you nothing about it is AI written. I don't do anything like that. And so what its purpose is is to provide you a solid foundation and understanding of the basics of forestry what forestry is, what silviculture is, some of the basic silvicultural treatments, and also some of the core measurements that you need to understand and be able to take as a landowner or forester in your own right. And of course, I have some useful conversions and volume tables and other things like that that might be handy for you as a landowner. So if you're interested, please go and check that out. I'll leave a link in the description and I'll leave it pinned in the first comment. And for those of you that are still watching and have stuck around and watched the entire video, thank you so much. I know that I can be a little long-winded sometimes, but I'm very passionate about these things, and I think it's important to give as much context as possible. Even though on the surface, mortality is a very simple concept, uh, I really feel like it's important to give you as much of the whole picture as possible in a single YouTube video. So again, thank you, and if you found this valuable, if you want to know more, of course, please like, subscribe, more coming your way. So, until next time, later.